Welcome to the WNCT Podcast Network. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of What the Politics. Now, before we get into today's topic, um, our guest today is our DC reporter, and today's topic will be about life as a DC reporter. So I'm going to go go ahead and ask our guest to please introduce herself. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm Allison Harris. I am a White House correspondent for News Nation, which is a new cable network. Um, owned by Nexstar, which people might be familiar with. They own 200 local TV stations and just launched this network news channel. And today, actually this morning, you guys are talking to me right after I did my first morning show. We just launched Morning in America, and I'm so excited to get to join the team. So it's a national morning newscast uh, from 7 to 10 a.m. our time here in Washington, Eastern. Um, And it's really exciting. It's fun to be a part of something new and to get to cover the White House. So not only are you part of something new, but you're also doing something new in one of the biggest cities in the entire world where things are happening. Um, Is it has it been kind of difficult to kind of even try to start getting some sort of reputation or even try to create contacts when there's already so much competitiveness in D.C.? I mean, for sure. Definitely. I think that's hard no matter where you're starting. Um, But I will say it is nice being a member of the White House Correspondents Association you already are part of a community. You obviously have a beat that you're dedicated to and covering. And everyone in the briefing room and at the White House has been incredibly welcoming, which is really nice, you know? And there's obviously a long storied history of people covering presidents. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's it's been a lot, you know, intimidating at times, as you might imagine, Um, but exciting too. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. And I think you've been uh, in in our email exchanges, you've been at this new position for about six months. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So where were you? Where were you prior? That's awesome. Where were you prior to this position? So before being here, I met Victoria because I was a reporter (laughs) in Dallas um, at the Fox affiliate in Dallas, which is home for me. I'm from McKinney, Texas, which is a town just north of Dallas. And I was there for five years. Um, and so covered, gosh, the Dallas police shooting happened about three months after I started there. Um, I covered Sutherland Springs, Hurricane Harvey, the El Paso and, and Odessa shootings, um, a lot of major stories, the Super Bowl in Houston, which was incredible, um, the NFL draft in 2018. So got to cover a variety of um, things while I was there. And then, of course, the pandemic and uh, made the move here to Washington about a year ago now, um, which is crazy and was interviewing for jobs while the insurrection was happening and in the midst of the pandemic. And I really moved here at quite a wild time for for D.C. Um, And yeah, now it's been six months. Mm -hmm. And so uh, full discretion, I was an intern (laughs) at KDFW and Allison was a reporter. And I have to say that you were very welcoming. I do remember one instance that kind of like stood out from my head. uh, I think from like the first year that I was there, I was very intimidated by all the reporters. And you like came up to me and you were like, hey, I can understand you being intimidated. So like like if you ever need any, if you ever want to ask any questions or even just have like a quick like chat about, you know, local news reporting or anything like that, like feel free because I think at some point you were an intern too and kind of knew the position that I was in, if that made sense. Absolutely. I'm glad to hear that because I don't remember that specifically, but I always, you know, just try to be a kind person in general. But definitely, I think, especially for women in the industry too, you know, you always want to look out for the next person coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm always aware of that. And I know the feeling, obviously, of being new. I mean, in journalism and in TV, you move a lot typically, you know? And so I started in Sherman, Texas, small town. I worked in Tulsa. I was in Dallas. Now I'm here in Washington. And I know how much it's meant to me to just have someone acknowledge like, hey, this might be overwhelming, you know, or (laughs) you might be meeting a lot of new people and, and trying to learn how to write for TV or produce or whatever the skill it is. So yeah, I'm glad to know that you remember that. Of course. And so let's get into the story that you that you reported on today. So t- tell me how your schedule looks like for a typical day and especially for today. 
So it changes, it literally changed this morning. Um, but I'm really excited about this new schedule. I've never done mornings before. So I've always done nights. I was, I did night side in Dallas. Um, so I've always been servicing, you know, the 10 o'clock news or whatever the nighttime news is. And here at News Nation, we have launched, we started launching um, a couple hours in the evening. I think it's four hours uh, in the evening, if I'm remembering it now, but we've also expanded. So we're on the air from five o'clock to 11 o'clock at night. And so I have been for the past six months doing stories for five o'clock, maybe getting booked on the six o'clock show. Um, I got to do a hit on Ashley Banfield's show and she was incredibly gracious to me. So I've been at the briefings, kind of starting my day at 11, noon, one, whenever the briefings are, which changes every day, um, and then staying there and doing live shots through the evening newscast. And they launched this morning show, and Washington really is uh, a daytime town. Things kind of shut down after happy hour, and especially covering the White House, everything's happening during the day. So I saw this as an opportunity to do the morning show. Um, I woke up at 5 a.m. today. And I was saying, you know, coming from Dallas, it's not so bad because when you're on the Eastern time zone, we're on the air at 7 a.m. Um, and I think in Dallas, you know, it's a little bit earlier and they're getting up at like, you know, my friends who do morning shows, they are getting up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. So it's not as bad, uh, you know, being on the air at 7 a.m. But yeah, so now I'll be doing the morning show. Um, I just took a little bit of a break. And when I got off the air and then I'm going to head back for the briefing at one o'clock. Okay. So what was your, uh, the topic for today, your story? So I am covering, um, Bannon. So the January 6th congressional committee, obviously it's investigating what happened on that day. Um, they're voting today, whether to ultimately refer, uh, criminal contempt charges to the justice department for former Trump white house advisor, Steve Bannon. So Trump obviously fired Bannon back in 2017, but the two stayed close and Bannon was on a podcast the day before January 6th talking about the potential for violence. So the committee members, including Adam Schiff, you know, I know that he has said that they want to know um, what he knew, what he was talking to Trump about, why he was talking about a potential for violence on the day before, and he's refused to comply. He's not showing up for deposition. He's not providing documents. So I talked about that and then also the news yesterday about former President Trump filing a lawsuit trying to block the release of thousands of White House papers from his administration relating to that day. He's saying that this is a fishing expedition. Um, and really, the former president, it's not that he has to win this lawsuit. He's saying that he has executive privilege. President Biden has made clear he, he's not going to invoke executive privilege in this instance. Uh, but he doesn't necessarily have to win this case. He can delay it. Because the midterms are ahead of us, if Republicans take back control of the House, there might not be an investigation into January 6th. You know, they might not want that to happen and could get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So really, this is something that is going to delay this investigation. And that could be ultimately good for the former president in itself. Sure. And so who are the some of the people that you talked to today for this story, the people you interviewed? And, and how did you, you know, scope those people out to say that these were going to be the best people to get expertise on for this story? Well, a lot of the members of the committee aren't, you know, they're not doing press conferences. But I did see um, Lofgren, Representative Lofgren spoke yesterday on MSNBC. Uh, I know Adam Schiff talked to NBC News. I'm just kind of keeping track of who's saying what, where. Um, and just, you know, keeping track of what's being said, reading the federal lawsuit that the former president has filed, reading his releases from um, from his uh, PAC, his statements that are that are being put out. So just trying to keep up with what's being said and what's the latest. This is this is happening behind closed doors. So, you know, we're hearing from Benny Thompson and some of these members when they come out and talk about the investigation. Mm -hmm. And so kind of going into um, uh I guess DC political reporting in itself, like the culture of DC political reporting, especially when it comes to uh, the way that uh, the general population feels about news. Um, have you come across any sort of, uh, I don't, I, I'm trying not to put it in like such a bad light because truly I don't know because I've never reported in DC, but has there been any sort of like competitive competitiveness, uh, the way that some questions are being asked, do you feel that there there's definitely some places maybe pushing um, a narrative or, or anything like that? Or does it seem to be the majority of reporters who are there um, are balanced? 
Um, I think in terms of competitiveness, my entire career, I feel like I've had good, um, like there's been good camaraderie with other journalists, whether they work at another station or another network. Like I have never run into that, which is, which is really nice. Um, in terms of bias, I think that, you know, you have to be honest and realistic that obviously there's always bias, you know, there's media bias. There are independent organizations that grade um, bias within these networks based on the stories they're doing on the air and what they're putting online. I have always told people to try to focus on more so the individual reporters because you can work for a network, but also be a very strict, you know, that, that might have a specific slant, but do a very good job in your independent, unbiased, fair, straightforward reporting. Um, and so I think I think that is my advice I would give to media consumers is to actually know who you're getting the information from, not just the network, but also the independent journalist. Um, and I'm always someone that has stuck to just straightforward news and not sensationalizing and doing my best to tell both sides of a story and be fair. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we all are aware that there are different organizations that slant different ways. Mm -hmm. Sure. And in that, have you found that it's been more difficult as a D.C. correspondent, as a D.C. reporter to get interviews with politicians and lawmakers and things like that? Have you found it to be more difficult in, in obtaining an interview than, you know, when you did local news? Yes, I think so. I think I think, you know, especially I'm, I'm in a unique position because we're at a new network and we're still establishing ourselves. And so we're trying to say this is who we are. This is what we're about. And it's more difficult to do when someone doesn't have familiarity with who are you, you know, what, what kind of work do you guys do? I think that's now getting better. Um, but speaking from my work in Dallas, like if you have a relationship with these people, you're known to cover these stories. They know what kind of reporting you do. They know that I'm not someone who's going to sensationalize. So there's a trust uh, level of trust there. I think that makes it so much easier. So yeah, I think, I think starting out here, we're just trying to build rapport say, this is who we are. This is our brand. And now I think that we've expanded to a morning show. We have more hours on the air. I think that politicians and lawmakers and people here in Washington are starting to pay closer attention. And I think that they want to talk to us because we don't have that reputation of being biased one way or the other. And that's something that I love about this network is it really is dedicated to being news for middle America, which is where I'm from. That's what I know. Um, and also very much dedicated to being down the middle. You know, it's it's refreshing to hear like this network believes there's a place in the political spectrum of news organizations for just down the middle, middle America, straightforward, unbiased reporting. And that's really something um, I'm excited to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And it's special. It's going to be especially difficult because there's a bunch of um, I, get, I would guess independent um, reporters or independent people who have YouTube or Substack or or some other sort of streaming service where it's it's those are now our competitors, um, which I find interesting. Um, but yeah, I, it's absolutely changing. There's so many streaming platforms. And I, I mean, I remember when I started in news, everyone was talking about like digital reporting and how that's, you know, it's just it's always going to be changing of how people are consuming. And I'm talking to you on my phone and people are consuming news through their phones and their social media feeds. I think that's ever evolving with our industry. Mm -hmm. And so going into a little bit more of the politics of what's happening in, in, um, in DC, one of the biggest stories that I've been following is what's going on in China. We had a, a political, uh, excuse me, a political science professor, I yes. believe, <laughs> uh, a few weeks back from Boston University who um, kind of gave us a little bit of, of uh, background about where China is and how it ended up there. But currently in current affairs, there's kind of this feeling of tension or some people are even calling it a cold war or a gray war, whatever you want to call it between the United States and China. And that Taiwan is being, um, is, is an important factor in uh, the relationship between whether or not we enter a real, well, I don't even want to call it like a real war, but whether or not but just a growing conflict and growing tension between China and Taiwan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is this one of the stories that you've been following or, or do you have anything to kind yeah, of relate? So, well, I did some reporting on it this last week, and I think it's been really interesting this month, like just knowing that China, October 1st, sent more than 30 planes into Taiwanese airspace. The next day they sent more. 
uh, within two days later, there were almost 60 planes that they were sending into Taiwanese airspace. So they're obviously like, you know, kind of, they're letting, they're letting Taiwan know that at a moment's notice, you know, they could attack, they could be in their airspace. And I think people are concerned about if there's a mistake of even Taiwan firing a warning sign in response, you know, God forbid if that hits a plane or there's some kind of crash, and then this evolves into a massive conflict. And what does that mean for the US? And what does that mean for the rest of the world? And I think everyone knows that these tensions and these relationships are delicate. The US is trying to maintain stability in that region. Um, and this is something that covering the president, I, I know that American audiences aren't often always interested in foreign policy. Obviously, Afghanistan was a huge story that Americans paid attention to and have a lot of um, vested interest in. But the president, when he talked about the exit from Afghanistan over and over consistently said and believes that the greater risk and concern and where America needs to shift its attention to is to China and is to Russia. And he's looking farther ahead in the horizon of these threats and where he thinks the U.S. needs to be uh, looking to for the future of potential conflicts, potential problem areas. So, yeah, that's something that I have I've ended up doing a lot of foreign policy, talking about, you know, what's happening with China, talking about Afghanistan. Uh, and it's it's definitely something to watch. Mm -hmm. Now, you just said that, you know, it's it's something that not many Americans necessarily always tune into foreign policies, right. foreign issues, things like that. So from your opinion, do you find doing um, Amer uh, American politics reporting versus foreign policy reporting, do you find one or the other to be more favorable for you to do? And do you find one to be more easier than the other to do when it comes to, you know, again, securing interviews, securing information, yeah. things like that? Well, I like that question a lot because I think what I enjoy, the reason I wanted to become a journalist to begin with, I love storytelling. I love learning something, but I also love like distilling down of, okay, what do Americans actually need to know? And I being from McKinney, Texas, you know, I think of like my family and my neighbors and I'm understanding how much is happening in Americans' day-to-day -day lives, especially in this pandemic, balancing childcare and going to work and just there's so much and it is difficult to stay up to date in this fast paced news cycle and especially with news out of Washington, especially with foreign policy. So I feel like I, I really actually am enjoying covering foreign policy and what's happening around the world. And hopefully my goal is to explain it in a way to people or share the news in a way that people come away with, okay, what do I actually need to know? How can I understand this better? Um, just like what's important, you know, and saying it conversationally. And I feel like that's something that I might be, you know, better at than other skills. And um, yeah, I, I enjoy getting to do that. The national politics is always fascinating. Also, having been in local news for years and talking to everyday people every day in Dallas and in Oklahoma, I feel like I maybe have an advantage here in Washington because I haven't been here for years. I know how these real people think. You know, I've talked to Democrats, I've talked to Republicans, I've talked to moderates, I've talked to people who are more radical, um, and it maybe gives me a better idea of, you know, like the zeitgeist of what people are actually thinking or how they feel about Donald Trump or how they feel about Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. And and what issues are important for them. So right. when it comes to something that's kind of also talking about issues that are important and talking about something that's a little bit more cur current is the is the fear around whether or not we're going to have a christmas simply because of well at the at the very foundational level for me from my pr perspective is because of global supply chain issues mm -hmm. and then yeah. also because of um a, a few of an, an inflationary prices that are inflated but because right. of th that's kind of like due to a variety of factors um wh what are you I don't want to say predicting, but what, what do you think is going to happen in the next few weeks from D.C. to either encourage people that, that you know, things are going to be better? Do you think that things are going to be better? Is there anything going on in D.C. that you're seeing that might kind of um, put the brakes on a lot of the fears that are happening about whether or not we're going to have a Christmas? Yeah, that's a great question, too. I don't know that I have a prediction for that, but I can tell you. From my experience alone, reporting on this administration for the past six months, I mean, think back to June when we were all so hopeful with these vaccines 
think back to July, I will never forget the moment of President Biden taking off his mask, you know, saying you don't have to wear these anymore if you get vaccinated, um, declaring, a, you know, a, a summer free of COVID, essentially. And there was such optimism, I think, for a little while. And then you have the Delta variant. And then you're dealing with Americans who don't want to get vaccinated. You know, you're dealing with the pushback of people who just are never going to get vaccinated. Then there was this huge effort to continue the vaccination effort. And so and then also with the president's domestic agenda. I mean, he's trying to get the largest legislation government overhaul since the New Deal passed. And we're still, you know, talking about infrastructure. We'll, we're still talking about these things that we thought we might not be talking about right now. Afghanistan happened. I mean, this administration has seen uh, a lot of things happen that they might not have predicted. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking about December 3rd. Once again, we're going to have to be talking about the debt limit and the debt ceiling. Like they pushed that to December 3rd. That's going to be up against uh, the wall for Christmas and the holidays also. I know that the administration, as I've been sitting in the briefing rooms, I've been listening to what they're doing to try and get the supply chain working again, helping businesses. But there's just simple, there's a lot of issues, you know? There were a lot when he came into office and it's not easy to solve a pandemic. It's not easy to you know, pass massive legislation, even if you do have the majority uh, in democratic control. And so I, who's to say, I guess? There, there's a lot that we're up against here and we're still dealing with um, the pandemic, we're dealing with millions of Americans still not rejoining the workforce, getting back to those pre-pandemic levels. Um, but it's obvious that the administration is, you know, is trying to, I'm getting a low battery notification. Sorry if that That's messed right. anything up. No, you're good. But yeah, you know, I, I, anyway, I don't know the prediction, but it's just, it's been interesting to see things change and, you know, pop up and that's, that happens with any presidency, but there's a lot. Mm hmm yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, talk, we talked about, you know, some of the issues and stories that you've been following over the past, you know, a couple of weeks and over your six months at, at NDC. Are there any other topics or policy issues or any other things that you're following that you, you know, you think are important topics that that American citizens should be following as well? Well, I'll just say I got to do, I think, like just a few weeks into my time with News Nation, I got to travel to the Mississippi Delta, a place I had never been before and actually talk to high school seniors, high school students about broadband internet. And it was incredibly eye-opening. And this is part of what the president's trying to pass. It actually does have bipartisan support um, with infrastructure to expand broadband access to these rural areas. And I think that most Americans might not even know how shocking it is that in 2021 in the United States, these high school seniors cannot access tutors they have available to them from Harvard and Yale and Ivy League schools who are trying to tutor them to help them pass their AP exams to get college credit. And these are smart students and these are great people and they just aren't getting the help that they need. And it's, it's shocking for people who are in major cities that internet accents would be something that, you know, hinders their ability to have a better education or better educational experience. So I, I hope to be able to do more of these stories where it's not just a Washington policy, but actually getting out and seeing how this affects real people. And so I want to be able to do more, more of that and talk about, you know, the child tax credit, universal pre-K, some of these real things that are being proposed and not just the fight between lawmakers of how to get it done and the sausage making, as Jen Zaki would say in the briefing. Yeah. Um, I have one comment and then one last question, Emily. I don't know if that you was had, my that was your last question. question. Yeah. So uh, my comment is I did not know how um, I, along the same kind of line that you were saying before I moved to North Carolina, I didn't realize how big of an issue internet access was for was for uh, like rural areas and moving to Greenville, North Carolina, which is the smallest town I've ever lived in. Um, <laughs> and I've seen a lot of small towns. A lot of these kids don't have access to internet and they don't, they can't, I mean, a lot of, I think it's, it's specifically um, in terms of like reading levels, kids are falling behind because right. they, they can't even access cla their classrooms with Zoom via, t uh, Zoom classrooms with their teachers. So it's, it, I was incredibly shocked. It's something that I agree with you does have bipartisan support because Senator, um, both Republican senators from the state of North Carolina and the um, uh, Democratic governor that we have here have both been pushing broadband infrastructure 
So I was also incredibly surprised about um, how vital internet is in this day and age yeah. and how a lot of people don't have it. Um, my last question for you is, and it's, a, it's, a, it's more fun, it's a fun question, but in DC, what has been your favorite monument? What has been your favorite oh. kind of like tourist attraction, restaurant? This is such a good question. <laughs> um, because there's so much, as you know, there's just so much to see and do here. And it's, it's so much fun. I mean, my favorite, I love the National Gallery. And I, I have always loved the National Gallery because I have memories of coming here with my parents. And my mom was an art major and her showing me the Impressionist art and teaching me about Monet and Pissarro and Degas and Renoir. And so I love, it's really cool to just be able to go, you know, walk in at any time and see those, you know, masterpieces and pieces of art. I love the Renwick Gallery, which is next to the White House. I love walking through the actual neighborhoods in Georgetown, especially in the fall, um, because it's just idyllic and adorable, frankly. Um, but it was fun. Uh, on a snow day we had, we went to the National Mall and there was a big snowball fight. I mean, it's just, it's fun. It's really cool to be here mm -hmm. and experience all of that. Awesome. Well, but to what you, what you were saying about the broadband and local, I just want to say, you know, as a reminder, because of someone who has a background in local news and what you guys are doing, I mean, those issues are so important. And I think it's what gets lost because we have so much to cover about the sausage making and how things get done and who's saying what here in Washington. You know, I would encourage you guys, obviously, with an interest in politics and in local news to continue finding those stories about, OK, how do I bring this home of how this could actually impact or help or harm our local populations, you know, because I think that's that's something that we all should focus more on when talking about politics. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Allison, for taking the time out of your busy, busy schedule to jump on the Zoom call with us and talk about this. We really appreciate your time today and all your insight and expertise. This was such a great conversation and, and really good insight, I think, for me and Victoria personally as well, just to kind of get to see, you know, the behind the scenes, the life of another reporter, you know, in D.C. So thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching another episode of What the Politics. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, um, wherever else you listen to your podcasts. And of course, if you want to check out our newest component, which is our video component, you can always check that out at WNCT.com under our features tab on the WNCT podcast network. Thanks so much for listening, you guys, and we'll see you next time.